this unit, we're going to talk first about hardware, and we're going to talk about the operating system that runs on that hardware, and then we're going to talk about the program products, things that you buy in addition to your operating system. All right, so this operating system we're running on is called ZOS, and it runs on IBM's biggest computer called a Z-Series. And this has really been just a continuous evolution over a long time. The IBM 360 introduced in 1964, a lot of things that were started there that are still part of this architecture. It's been expanded and modernized quite a bit, but uh, there's uh, a lot of things that were you know done very well back then as far as architecture that are still uh, still active here. So there's, uh, there's advantages and disadvantages of this architecture it scales up very well. If you wanted to have some kind of system to run in your bank, and you're a bank like Bank of America that has 10,000 offices across the U.S. with dozens of tellers in each office, you know, you're talking about potentially 100,000 people need to connect to your computer system. This system will scale up to that. So that's good. It's stable. It'll stay up. I, th I think our system is typically up for months at a time and uh, been in environments that haven't had to reboot their uh, mainframe for a year. IBM and a lot of other people support this environment, so uh, you, know, you can hire people that know how it works. And if you wrote programs on it 10 years ago, they probably still run. You know, it's centrally managed, so you can have a worldwide organization with security people in New York and operators in Tokyo, and the uh, security group in New York can manage the uh, security for the whole enterprise. So it's, there's a lot, of, a lot of things to say for this. You know, it's the reason why it continues to be popular in spite of the costs, and that's one of the disadvantages. The hardware that ZOS runs on is expensive to get started. And typically, the cheapest mainframe you could buy is a hundred thousand dollars and it also needs disk drives to connect to it and that's going to be another hundred thousand dollars so you don't usually find a grocery store running ZOS because it just doesn't scale down it scales up but not down and it takes some staff to maintain it you know Protech is as small of a company as you'll find running a mainframe and it stretches us a little bit to stay in front of the thing if we made more changes it would stress us a lot worse you don't spend your whole working day maintaining your PC, but you could spend your whole working day maintaining your mainframe. On your mainframe, your Z series, you don't have to run ZOS, but that's what we're running. But there's other operating systems that you could run instead of, and you can actually run more than one at a time. We have a mainframe we just bought that's running VM. It's like the VMware tool. So you got a Intel box running VMware and then you can run two copies of Linux side by side on top of it, right? Well, VM was the first operating system that did that. So you can IPL it on your mainframe. IPL stands for Initial Program Load. It's like rebooting. They just don't say reboot your mainframe. They say IPL. But you can IPL VM, and then underneath of it, you could run every one of these other operating systems simultaneously, and it will time slice between them. Some combinations are very common, like VSE, doesn't really have any uh, interactive user component, so people use VM to log on to, and they use VSE to run the batch jobs. A Skunkworks project inside of IBM ported Linux to run on the, on the Z series, actually on the S390 that was the current machine back then, and another group outside of IBM did it too, because it's open source, anybody could have done it. We weren't quite sure why they were going to do it, but IBM has really jumped on this Linux bandwagon now because IBM makes a lot of money making hardware, you know, really good high-end computer hardware. So they figured if people would buy their hardware and run Linux on it, that was good for them. TPF is the other one. It's kind of, it's odd. You only see it in the airline and hotel reservation business. If you want to have a million terminals instead of 100,000 terminals, you kind of grow out of ZOS and into the world of TPF. It stands for Transaction Processing Facility. It's the least popular of all these operating systems. Sabre Group, Hilton Hotels, places like that would run this in their data center. And they would also run ZOS. So typically they run them side by side. One machine runs TPF and another one connected to it runs ZOS. Okay, I've broken down here a quadrant of different kinds of hardware you could buy and what it's good for. Because in a modern data center, you'll find all of these different things and, uh, you know, why. 
It's because they're good at certain things, right? So the PCs that you guys are familiar with, you'll find in heavy use because they're very inexpensive hardware. Because they're mass produced, they have pretty high quality and pretty high capability, yet are very inexpensive for web servers and databases and things like that, for uh, things that would host Linux. Again, yeah, it's inexpensive to get going there. However, that hardware is not as reliable as some of the other hardware things. For example, there's a thing called error correcting memory. You know, as the earth gets bombarded by radiation, you know, as the sunspots levels go up, you can hear it in your AM radio, etc. And that radiation coming through the atmosphere actually causes occasional memory errors. Low-end PCs don't have error-correcting memory in them, so they don't have parity bits and things to tell if the memory's been corrupted and refresh it from a calculated value. Higher-end server PCs do, and all these other systems do, too. They would have error-correcting memory, so it just makes them more reliable. Okay, over on the left here, we've got Unix systems, and you'll find that as an end-user perspective, you can't really tell the difference. Linux behaves just like Solaris or HP UX or AIX to an end user, but to an administrator, they're different. You'll see this a lot in commercial environments. A large mainframe site would typically run AIX because that's IBM's flavor of Unix. So if they have Unix, they would have AIX. University environment, like especially in California, would run Sun Microsystems stuff because, you know, Sun Microsystems is hosted out of there. Sun was founded by people from Berkeley, former Berkeley students that went in the business. What Unix is good for, these kind of Unix servers with a RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computing, and it's a machine with simple instructions that's just blazingly fast and has a lot of engines, you know, a lot of processors that can run in parallel. So this hardware is usually pretty cost effective, not as cheap as a PC, but a lot more powerful. And the operating system is pretty cheap because it's a commodity. You know, it all came from AT&T and Berkeley. So database servers, like Oracle servers, more of them run on Unix than anything else. There's more internet service done in Unix than any other platform. IBM built a thing to play chess with. And, you know, with playing chess, you need to calculate all the possible moves and then all the possible moves based on whether you made one of the first moves, like what would the second move be, etc. And they didn't do that project on ZOS. They did it on an AIX that had like 256 processing CPU chips on it and all connected together working on this one problem. They had Gary Kasparov play against it, and it beat him. Okay, up in the right-hand corner here, we have mini computers. And if anything is dying on this chart, it's this quadrant here. The AS400 is an IBM machine. It's been relabeled the I-Series now, but it's a smaller thing. It sort of behaves a little bit like a mainframe, but a little bit like a Unix server. It's proprietary to IBM. You can't really buy an AS400 from anybody but IBM. DEC had a system called DMS that fits in this category. DEC has since become part of HP, and HP is sort of keeping that thing alive on life support. Tandem is uh, also a part of HP now, and they have a proprietary system that has redundant hardware, like they do on the space shuttle. They have four computers calculating the trajectory, and they compare their answers, and if three of them agree and one of them doesn't, they throw out the non-agreeing one and they fly on that architecture protects you from hardware failures or things like that. But because these things are proprietary, there's not as much competition in their design. They tend to be more expensive. It's the competition that brought the cost of the PC down. The Macintoshes never had much competition. You spend more for a Mac, even to this day. Mac didn't even make it on the chart here, did it? Shoot. My apologies, guys. Okay. And then, of course, in the upper left, we have our Z-Series and its predecessor, the S390. What makes these machines good is that they have tremendous I.O. capability. They can write to 60,000 disk drives simultaneously. The network connection is gigabit speed and multiple network connections all running in parallel. So these are for big organizations, for accounting, financial work, 